volunteering or if you came out to our fall social. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we had a lot of fun fun seeing everyone come out. You guys are super artistic, so it was just fun getting to see everyone and having a chill evening. Um, I did want to say as well, um, if you are a fall pumpkin or drying winter from last night, make sure you come to see Kale before um, the end of the meeting or before you leave um, to grab a t-shirt, your t-shirt. Um, and then lastly, we do have our um, PBMA fundraiser going on tonight at Chipotle until 9 p.m. Um, it's right, literally like right across the street next to Newport Music Hall, um, just directly across high. Um, and again, that'll be going on until 9 p.m. 33% um, of all proceeds are going to be going to us, and we're going to pick a charity um, later of our choosing to donate all those proceeds to. Um, so if you haven't gone to get the Chipotle, make sure you do that later if you want. Um, make sure you use the little flyer that we sent in our group me um, when you check out so they know it's for um, our organization. And if you don't have it, we can give it to one of you guys at the end. Um, and then lastly, if you do get Chipotle, make sure you um, send a picture to Kale so we can give you guys an extra point. So yeah, I think that's it. And again, if um, you guys haven't signed in for attendance, feel free to do that at the end. And um, yeah, make sure you're good. I'll hand it over to Paige to um, get introductions started on. All right, so our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Carson. She is an assistant professor at the Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine, and she teaches soft tissue surgery on the clinical track. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Paige. Um, like Paige says, my name is Brittany Carson. I'm one of the veterinary surgeons over at the vet school here. Um, Paige asked me to speak a few months ago. Um, so. I've decided to kind of present a little bit about how I got to where I'm at, because I figured as pre-vet students, you guys are probably all interested in that. I don't go into a lot of detail, but then I was going to discuss some of the cool cases that I've seen and a little bit about what my day-to-day -day looks like as a surgeon in academia. But there's going to be quite a bit of time at the end for any questions you guys might have. Um, I'm sure the last year or so, maybe to haven't had as many in-person opportunities to ask questions. And I remember as a pre-vet student having a lot of questions about applying and we're in that time of year. So I figured if you guys had any specific questions, I might be able to help in that manner as well. So feel free to ask questions towards the end. Um, there are going to be some graphic pictures as well. Again, figure with pre-vet students, you guys are okay with that, but there is a slide. So I, I'll give you guys some time if anybody wants to leave when I'm showing pictures of cases, because they will be mostly surgical pictures um, and wound pictures, but uh, they're pretty cool. And for people who are interested, I think uh, it'll be something you guys might think is intriguing. There are cases that I have found interesting. So usually people at the um, little bit earlier level find them interesting as well. So a little bit about me, I did my education at Iowa State. So I did my undergrad degree in animal science um, at Iowa State. I uh, had all of the dates that I graduated on there, but it made me feel old, so I took them off. Um, but uh, I then after I completed my Bachelor of Science, I took a year off and worked at a shelter for a year to get in-state tuition because I'm actually from Illinois. Um, and uh, in that year, thought that I initially going in, thought that I wanted to do either shelter medicine or behavior. Uh, working in a shelter as I, I had done a lot of volunteer work, but actually working in the shelter for that year really changed my mind about what what I wanted to do. Um, and the other career choice I was thinking of at the time was surgery. Um, and unlike most of my peers going into vet school knew going in, I wanted to be a surgeon. A lot of people just so if any of you aren't sure what you want to do in vet med yet, that's actually much more normal than my track was. Um, so don't feel like you have to have it all figured out at this stage. But whenever I actually got into vet school, um, after that year, gap year, um, again, attended Iowa State, uh, did quite a few uh, clubs. Um, I did a lot of teaching in vet school as well. So I did uh, anatomy teaching assistant for three years. Um, my first through or my helped out in my first year. And then my second through my fourth year also did some teaching assistants there. Um, and I did a little bit of that in my undergrad degree as well. Um, and then 
my and once I got to Ohio State for internship and residency, I did a, a concurrent master's of science um, with my residency, which was required at the time, not as impressive as it seems. It was actually something that they required of me to do with my residency, uh, but I got that from Ohio State a couple of years ago. And then the pictures that I have up, one of them is from when I did a study abroad trip, my fourth year of vet school. Uh, we did wildlife immobilization in South Africa, so I worked with a lot of rhino. Um, and then I did my, uh, my master's project is the paper that's listed there. And then uh, that picture of me with the dog and the level was doing my master's research project on the effect of oral uh, administration of gabapentin on the minimum alveolar concentration of uh, isofluorine in dogs. So that's one of the inhalant anesthetics that we use in dogs. Gabapentin is something we commonly use for pain control. Um, and we found in this study that administration of gabapentin actually will reduce the amount of that inhalant anesthetic you have to use. Um, so it's a pretty important information. It's the first time that we've established uh, utilization of a um, oral uh, medication for pre-medication in dogs. Um, so pretty interesting. <laughs> Uh, so after I finished vet school, I then went on to do a one-year small animal rotating internship here at OSU. Um, I got to rotate through our medicine, radiology, um, surgery, and anesthesia services, primarily um, ER and surgery. Um, during that time, just reiterated the fact that I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. The caseload at Ohio State is quite high. It's got a, the biggest academic uh, surgeon group in the country. So we have 10 surgeons right now. We're actually looking to hire three to four more. So it's, uh, it's quite large. And that was a really big appeal for the variety of mentorship and things that I had available to me. Luckily, Ohio State wanted to keep me. And so I got to stay on for residency. Um, and for those of you who don't know, when you do a small animal surgery residency, you actually will rotate 50% through orthopedic and a soft tissue service here at Ohio State. And a growing field right now is uh, surgical oncology. So I got to rotate through both soft tissue and surgical oncology. Um, but I, I suspect as you guys go through the process and get into um, later postdoc training and things, more and more of that will be available. It is a growing field with surgical oncology. Um, so again, Ohio State has a really big caseload, um, so got to rotate through and, and manage lots and lots of cases, work with lots of other specialists as well to kind of build my skills. And then with uh, the didactic training that's offered, I um, had to do rounds and participate in rounds as well as present in rounds um, and journal club and things like that, um, which was um, a lot of work. And then I also, again, had to do that concurrent master's, which we recently are phasing out. Um, so. Uh, the upside to the incoming residents is it's less work for them. Uh, the downside now as a teacher on the other side is it's less classes that I get to teach, but uh, I think it'll overall be better for our residents. Um, and then one of the other things that I kind of had uh, crystallized for me in residency was how much I enjoy teaching students and the, my fellow house officers. Um, so that really kind of made it clear that I wanted to go into academia for my career and not just do clinical medicine. Um, but uh, uh, really enjoyed my residency so much so that I then went on to stay on as a faculty member at OSU. Um, so my first year I was a clinical instructor, so I didn't do as much of the teaching and things. It was 100% clinical appointment, so I just got to work as a surgeon. Um, and in 2020, I got hired on as a full-time faculty member as an assistant professor. And so now I basically have three jobs. So I am a teacher. So I teach the graduate students this semester. I'm teaching advanced respiratory uh, surgery. So the graduate students include our residents. Um, so it's primarily just a 10 person course where I'm just teaching directly to the residents. And then I also teach our veterinary students the core surgery courses. So they learn a lot of our, their basic surgery skills. And then the lab where they kind of put everything together and do their first spays and neuters, that's the course that I'm teaching this spring. Um, it's really exhilarating, it's fun. The students are all really scared in that class and it's a really, it's a really fun experience to see that they actually are, recognize how much they've learned and things through that course. So it's a really gratifying course to teach and they usually do very well. Um, and then my research job, um, we're actually going to start uh, assessing cortisol levels in first time students. So 
that lab course I'm going to be teaching with all of the students that are coming in terrified to do their first surgery, we're actually going to test their cortisol levels in their spit right before their first surgery to see if it's different than uh, just sitting in a lecture, um, which I suspect it will be. Um, but uh, that's one of the research projects I have coming up. I'm pretty excited about that one as well. And then most excitingly with my job, um, I'm a clinical surgeon. So I do general surgery, which as a soft tissue surgeon, I primarily am doing a lot of surgical emergencies right now with COVID. Um, we are all very limited in the amount of staffing we have, as well as uh, just our ability to get cases through. And so most of what we end up doing are emergencies. That is mostly foreign body obstructions, hemoabdomen, which is when dogs have masses in their abdomen that bleed into their bellies. Um, GDV or bloat, uh, C-sections, which everybody knows that, and then cholecystectomies is another really common surgical emergency. It's gallbladder removal um, that can make dogs really sick. And then one of the loves of my life is wound management and reconstruction. So a couple of the cases we're going to discuss are some of the biggest wound cases I've had. Um, but uh, that's a really labor-intensive, really gratifying uh, process to treat. It takes a lot of time. Um, I do some oncologic surgery. We do have a, de a devoted service that does surgical oncology. However, um, we do see those appointments and things. And then we'll do some elective surgeries too. We, we don't do a lot of spays and neuters as the, surgeon, the surgery group at OSU, but some of the minimally invasive options uh, for spays and neuters, uh, more so cryptorchid neuters than classic neuters, and then gastropexy where we're attacking the stomach for bloat to prevent that. Um, and then any of the other less emergent type cases that we have come in as appointments, we'll take them to surgery as well. Um, but uh, primarily right now we're doing mostly surgical emergencies to the point where we actually have a separate service that just manages our surgical emergencies at this point. So this is that slide I talked about with the graphic pictures. So if anybody doesn't want to see graphic pictures, um, usually when I prepare people for them, then they seem less graphic than they actually are. Um, and recognizing some of these, it may be a little hard to see the anatomy, especially if you aren't used to seeing it. So I'll point it out for you, but pretty interesting stuff. Um, so this is a case of Ava. This is a two-year-old German Shepherd, one of the only ones I don't have a picture of her face. So Ava presented to our clinic after going to her local veterinarian for having some intermittent diarrhea and just being off for the last couple of months. Um, and so they took an x-ray of her belly and saw that it just looked like a big solid mass in her abdomen. Um, so for the people on Zoom, I'm going to point it out on my screen. I don't know if you guys can see my pointer very well. Uh, but on the CT scan, the dog's laying on its back and we take slices kind of through um, across. So this is a, basically if we cut the dog um, in half with her laying on her back, um, kind of parallel to the table, um, this would be what it is. So her liver's up here in her gallbladder, all of this is a mass in this dog's abdomen. It's a German Shepherd, it's a big dog. And so this is the mass here. And uh, there's a little tiny, like the entire thing just kind of shelled out of the belly. And then this is a loop of intestines. And this here, this little tiny thing that was probably a little bit smaller than my pinky finger was the only thing attaching that dog's tumor to its body. Um, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, our basins are big. Um, I know the kids on Zoom won't be able to see it, but they're probably like this big around and that completely filled it and was overflowing it. Um, it ended up coming back as a, uh, um, a lyomyosarcoma. So that's a tumor of, of smooth muscle, uh, but it was so non-differentiated or irregular that they actually had to send out for special staining to determine the type of tumor it was. The dog felt so much better just not having that space occupying mass that she was like back to normal the next day, even though she had a big major surgery. So um, one of the fun things about being a surgeon is, for animals is that our patients are way more resilient than people. If a person had a surgery for a tumor that size, they would be down and out for about a week to two weeks and be minimally mobile. A dog wakes up the next day and is like, oh my God, I feel so much better. And just, you have to remind them to be quiet. So um, it's really, really gratifying to treat these guys in this case in particular because the dog was so young. She did great. Um, she just came back for her recheck with our medical oncology service. Um, her surgery was last December. She came back for her, um, I think it's her fourth recheck since, um, and uh, she's doing great. She still doesn't have any recurrence, so hopefully she'll go on to live a long, um, healthy life. But uh, 
this isn't a type of tumor we've seen in this location in this type of dog before. So we'll see how she ends up doing. But uh, it was a really cool case and the tumor was fascinating. Um, initially, we actually had no idea what we were going to find when we went in. Our radiology group was like, it's so big. We don't even, we don't know what organ it's associated with. We don't know if it's like a pus filled uterus or if it's a tumor, no idea. So um, this was a case where surgical explore was really kind of the next diagnostic test for this dog, in addition to being able to treat her. But it was a cool case, bizarre. And then Bo was another two-year-old dog. There's actually a picture of him there. Um, he was a Labrador who had about a one month history of just not quite feeling right and having a little bit of increased respiratory effort. Um, we diagnosed him with an uh, infection in his chest called a pyothorax. Um, that's a type of infection we commonly see with sport type dogs when they're running around in fields and things. They'll get migrating plant foreign bodies. Either they inhale them or they swallow them and then they can migrate through their lungs. So on this picture, my finger is touching the heart. So this heart is so encapsulated with infected tissue that it doesn't look recognizable. This is a no more normal looking lung lobe, but all of this kind of brown stuff in here is mediastinum, which normally is lacy and thin and not really noticeable in the chest. It was filling this dog's chest. Um, so he, as bad as this chest look, this is actually about three hours after surgery. The video wouldn't load for me, but he was eating within three hours after surgery, even with his chest looking this bad. Um, so this dog, again, felt great after surgery. Uh, we ended up by uh, removing a portion of a lung lobe back here that actually had a, a hole in it um, related to an abscess. Um, so it was kind of interesting. You could see, I might see if I can pull the video up for you. Um, after the PowerPoint's over, it didn't want to pull up very well. I have another video on here, but this one didn't want to pull up very well. But if you guys are interested, I can see if I can pull it up on the laptop separately from the PowerPoint and see if it'll actually play there that way. But every time the dog breathes, you can see the bubbles coming out of the lung that has a hole in it. It's kind of interesting. But uh, in the video, it just kind of looks like a mess of mediastinum and then bubbles. So um, I figured I'd show you guys the pictures first and then see what the interest level is. But um, with this type of surgery, it's pretty invasive. We actually have to make an incision down the center of their sternum and cut their chest open that way. So it's breaking their sternum apart to do it. Um, but that way we can actually explore the whole chest because often we have imaging before surgery, but it's never, with these cases in particular, an explorer is really important to be able to determine what the cause is. And sometimes we never find a definitive cause, which is always disheartening. Um, but uh, you can see in this picture as well, um, it looks very minimal here, but there's a little kind of white chunk of stuff here. The Whenever we got down in this pocket, which we couldn't get pick good pictures of because the dog's somewhat deep chested, it just literally looked like the dog's chest was filled with cottage cheese. It was really gross. Um, but uh, again, getting all of that out, and this is all of the flush that we use. So this is the first canister. All of this is just white blood cells here. And then as we flushed, it cleared it out. So just doing that alone made him feel a lot better as well. But he was eating within three to four hours after surgery. Dogs are amazing. Um, somebody had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did remove a lot of that um, mediastinum. So for those of you on Zoom, since I doubt you could hear him, um, the question was for the mediastinum that we didn't remove, uh, did it get better with just antibiotic therapy or what did we do to treat that? And yes, we did treat that dog. Usually for this disease process, we treat for six to eight weeks with antibiotics based on culture. So we removed a lot of the dog's mediastinum, mostly because it was inhibiting our ability to drain the dog's chest. So um, they had actually placed chest tubes in this dog to manage him before we were able to get him to surgery to drain his chest um, and weren't really getting much off of his chest and leading up to surgery over the about two days before we actually were able to get him into surgery. Uh, when we got into surgery to drain his chest um, for our explorer, we actually ended up pulling two liters of just straight pus out of the dog's chest that they weren't able to get to with the, uh, the chest tubes just related to how voluminous his mediastinum was. So that was one of the big important things we did, which as you can imagine, looking at that picture, nothing looks normal in there. It's all the same color. And so finding all of the big, important, scary structures that live in the chest, like the big vessels and um, some of the nerves and things that are there that are important for the diaphragm to be able to function, really hard to find. Um, so it's a big challenge. 
anatomy um, to be able to identify all of those things. But uh, we, we do remove a lot of the mediastinum in these cases and then treat them very long term with antibiotic therapy. Recurrence is a big risk in these cases as well, um, mostly because we suspect that there's probably foreign material that may or may not be identified. Even if you identify it, it doesn't eliminate the risk of there being foreign material elsewhere in the body too um, that could cause recurrence. Um, my favorite uh, story from my mentor that's been a surgeon at OSU for 30 years is they had a dog that they explored chest three times. <laughs> Um, even after imaging and things, and finally found a stick this long, just right inside of its pleural space that they hadn't been able to identify before until it finally kind of ruptured through the, um, the lining of the chest cavity in one of the procedures. Um, so, but that dog had recurrence multiple times before they were able to actually find a definitive cause. This dog has done really well. It's been in about a year since his procedure as well, and he has not had any recurrence. So um, I suspect that his procedure, it was related to um, him swallowing something he shouldn't have that then created an abscess in his, between his lung and his esophagus, um, which based on where we found his injury, that's what I think happened with him. But which is good news for the dog in this case, even though his chest looked terrible, he'll have a lot of scarring and things in there, but should be able to have a normal life. So a lot of these dogs end up being hunting dogs and tracking dogs and things and can go on to live normal lives after. Any other questions about Bo? Yes. Um, just a general question about how do you go about Great. Um, so uh, one of your classmates asked uh, how we go about uh, breaking apart the sternum in these cases. We use a saw. Um, so we actually will saw the, the, uh, down the sternum in the center of it. Um, so even our residents that really enjoy orthopedics love this procedure because they still get to use power tools. It's one of the few times we get to do that in soft tissue surgery. Um, but interestingly, the other option is to go in through the side of the chest. It limits your ability to be able to explore, which is why we choose the, what seems like a more aggressive option. But when we actually cut down the sternum with a saw, those dogs are less painful after surgery than they are when we go in through the side. Some of that's related to the way we close because we actually entrap the nerves when we close them when they're cutting into the side of their chest as opposed to along the sternum. But other than that too, it's just every time they breathe, it moves that incision and that can be painful, whereas that doesn't happen with the sternum. So there's less movement there. We actually close them with wire um, to make it so that that doesn't move. So once it's stable, those guys actually feel really good after surgery, even though it's a really aggressive procedure. Bo acted like a normal dog the next day, um, which some of that's because he's a lab and this would know about better, no offense. Um, but, uh, but, it's pretty characteristic of dogs in general. Again, dogs are amazing. I cannot stress that enough. Um, you can. Um, if the risk associated with it is implant infection. So because we use wire, because it's going to be the most stable, um, they can get infections in that wire and then you have to go back and remove it later. That's very rare, um, but it can happen. Other than that, I mean, you can get some fracture of the sternum and things just from the manipulation and opening them because of the way we close them and push everything together. It's not a load bearing bone. And so usually they heal fine and it's not a major issue. Um, and then bleeding is another risk too. There's some big vessels in that area but overall the uh the actual approach and the closure is minimal risk to the animal in comparison to the risks associated with the surgery itself once you get inside the chest does that make sense yes um so the other the another question was how long did the procedure take um his procedure took probably about once we actually got into the or and got into his chest probably about two hours mostly because it was so challenging to identify structures in his, in his chest. At one point, uh, we were actually looking for the lung that was affected because we were noticing that he wasn't able to hold his oxygen very well whenever they were doing breath holds for him. And then we noticed the bubbles that I talked about earlier. But uh, when we were looking down in that area of the chest, our anesthesia service actually mentioned that his uh, blood pressure was bottoming out because we were pulling on his vena cava and had no idea um, just because everything looks the same in there. So honestly, the procedure itself wasn't challenging and other than the fact that we couldn't identify structures easily and it took a lot of time to just go through the anatomy and find everything that was important that we didn't want to damage. Um, but uh, the chest cases for pyothorax in particular can take a long time for that reason.
Any other questions about Bo? Cool. So yeah, he was a really interesting cases. Um, I had the best pictures from him. This is one of the worst ones that I've seen. And the dog, even before surgery, knowing now what his chest looks like, he, I would have never guessed that based on how he looked before surgery. Um, he had just a little bit of increased respiratory effort, wasn't panting, just a lot of just breathing a little harder than normal. And uh, for that to be what his chest looked like, would have never guessed. So this is Daisy. Daisy is a six month old English bulldog. Um, she was born at OSU via C-section. Um, unfortunately, most bulldogs can't breed or give birth on their own. So we see a lot of them at OSU. Um, and in her picture up to the side, you can see her nose looks a little funny. Um, so she actually has a congenital cleft palate. So this is, she's laying on her back in this picture and we're looking at her hard palate. You can see there's a large defect here. This is one of the biggest cleft palates I've seen. And then this little triangle of tissue where her incisors are here, are canines. Um, this little triangle of tissue also was not connected um, with any of the soft tissues. But you look at her picture here, you can see this, no, this uh, nostril actually droops a little bit. Um, and that's from her having a partial cleft lip as well. And so even though we knew, we diagnosed her with a cleft palate as a puppy when she was born, but there's, there, uh, the tissues in their mouth are so fragile at that age that we can't really do much with them until they're about four to six months old. So Daisy, I think I said she was six months old, but she was actually five months old when we did her procedure. Um, so we, what we did was we made an incision um, along this side, we moved this, but we made an incision along her tooth line here, went all the way back. You can't see it well in this picture, but her soft palate is also clefted. So it's not at attached to either side there. But for the hard palate, we made an incision along here. And then we actually flipped this upside down and tucked it underneath here, which is what you see here. So this is the bone of her palate over here. And this is that uh, the fleshy tissue that we flipped upside down and then sutured it to the other side. And then we kind of sutured this structure here as well, and then made incisions along her soft palate and sutured that together as well. So this is her about four weeks later this uh, basically this whole area we expect to just heal um, on its own it fills in with tissue and scar tissue all by itself and that's what it's doing here so she's making a real valiant effort but importantly the entirety of this incision actually remained intact and we had prepared this owner for at least having to revise it two to three times so we were pretty excited about the fact that it actually healed very well in the first go some of that is just related to how diligent these owners were with not letting the dog put anything in its mouth after surgery. Um, and some of it is just luck. Um, we definitely were very diligent in the way that we repaired this, but the mouth is a pretty tricky spot to do surgery. Um, luckily, dogs will heal in their mouth in spite of you, um, but uh, certainly the tissues here aren't normal. And this is a really big cleft. Um, I mean, it's probably about uh, at least a centimeter and a half, which I know most of you probably don't think in metrics yet, but that's about half an inch, um, a little bit less. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty big for a dog this size, but uh, it was a pretty interesting case. Um, her owners were very worried about us wanting to repair her lip and uh, came in saying they didn't want to do it, which we agreed with um, because there's actually nothing wrong with her lip. She just looks a little funny. But uh, that was the main thing they were worried about was that they didn't want her nostril fixed because they liked the way it looked. So we reassured them that we had no interest in fixing the nostril. We just cared about how big this palate defect was. Um, and really the main reason that we want to fix that, especially in a dog like Daisy is it makes them at higher risk of getting aspiration pneumonia and things. They'll get thing, they'll get uh, material and food stuck up into their palate and then get inflammation and infections in their no nasal cavities as a result, which then can get down into their, um, down into their lungs. Um, bulldogs in particular are at a pretty high risk of developing pneumonia to begin with. So it could actually be a pretty life limiting thing for her. But luckily for Daisy, she's doing really, really well. Her four, her four week recheck was probably two to three months ago. And those owners were contacting me pretty regularly. And now that she's eating again, she hasn't had any recurrence of signs. So I've heard less from them, which is usually a good thing with a bulldog owner. Um, so really, really excited at how well she healed. 
Um, unfortunately, cleft palate is a pretty common thing we see in the flat face brachycephalic dogs, more so in Frenchies, but we do see it from time to time in the English Bulldogs. Um, they really wanted to breed this dog originally when uh, she was born, but this is a heritable condition, so we had to explain why that was a bad idea. Any questions about Daisy? She's less exciting than Bo was. Patches is just interesting because of how big his tumor was. So Patches had a very large tumor um, that had been monitored at her local veterinarian or his local veterinarian for, I wanna say three years. Um, once it got to be about football size, they recommended that it be removed but weren't comfortable removing it because of the location. Recommended he come to OSU. He had an appointment scheduled with us for the end of March of 2020. And then COVID hit and we had to cancel all of our appointments. So he waited, um, but uh, the tumor just kept growing and growing and got to a point where it actually, he was catching it on. He was still like jumping fences and things with this tumor, catching it on things, making it bleed, dragging it around. Um, and just was not a very friendly dog as a result. Um, but uh, we resected this tumor. It ended up being just a, a lipoma or a fatty tumor. So um, the reconstruction was pretty minimal, but you can see, just this is a student for scale, how big that tumor is. I think it ended up being um, 23 pounds total that this dog was walking around with. Um, but So he lost a lot of weight after his procedure. And this is him about two and a half weeks later. <coughs> the other interesting thing about patches is um, we usually we'll do routine blood work on patients before and whenever they're five or older, just to make sure their systemic health is okay. And that there's not any other triggers to make us concerned that something else could be going on with them. And on his uh, CBC, which looks at their red and white blood cells, everything looked normal. We took him to surgery. And then the next day we got a pop-up from our pathologist who had finished reading his slide out and he surprised had heartworm infection um, that uh, had not been noted until after we took him to surgery. So not ideal, but this is his, this picture here is actually from one of his rechecks when he started his heartworm treatment. Um, so you can see in the very first picture, he's got a muzzle on and he was not actually, he was not easy to work with at all. We had to sedate him to do most anything with him. He really liked his student who's holding his tumor in that picture. Um, but honestly, I think a lot of it was just discomfort from that tumor because whenever he came back, he was, he's not wearing a muzzle in this picture. Obviously we were able to take his stitches out without having a muzzle on him. And he was much more handleable for everything. So I think it's easy to take for granted how those big, how uncomfortable those big tumors can be. I mean, he was literally dragging it around and making it bleed. So, um, and his owners tried to do the right thing. Just, it just grew astronomically once uh, we had to cancel his appointment for the pandemic, but he's doing great now. Um, doesn't have heartworm anymore, living his best life. Any questions about patches? Yeah. Um, I don't remember what his specific weight was, but I remember the tumor. So his weight dropped by, I think about 23 pounds. Cause that's how much the tumor weighed. But, um, I'm pretty sure that this dog is about a 20 ish kilogram dog. Sorry. I work mostly in metric now. So, um, but, uh, he, we put it in pounds cause that was easier for most people to remember, but, um, it, uh, the tumor was huge. Um, we, we weighed this one. We actually had another tumor that we thought was the biggest lipoma we'd seen. It only weighed 17 pounds. So, um, we had a string of really big lipomas right after the pandemic from people trying to get in finally after waiting so long to have their tumors removed. But yeah, sorry, I don't remember his weight before and after, but it definitely varied by 23 pounds. <laughs> Any other questions about patches? So Raven, this is one of my all time favorite cases because the dog was just lovely to work with. She was a five-year-old German Shepherd. She still is, not was, she's still alive. No spoilers, um, but uh, she was run over by her owners. Um, and about three weeks later, there weren't any visible injuries at the time. They took her to her local veterinarian right after she was hit, didn't find anything going on with her. She acted well and normal. Um, but about three weeks later, they started noticing that the skin, she was getting like what looked like a big blister on her skin and some of her hair was starting to fall out on her back. Um, and so a veterinarian in their area, they lived in Indiana, um, actually tried to place drains under her skin because they thought it was just a really big seroma forming or just sterile fluid under the skin. Um, and that unfortunately introduced an infection there that then uh, ultimately 
uh, resulted in the dog having a pretty significant uh, infection in addition to the skin dying on the back, which isn't related to the drains. That's actually the reason she was having the fluid accumulation. So when she was hit by the car, somehow in the rolling her over, the skin was actually sheared from its blood supply. And it takes some time for that to actually declare itself and especially in a heavily coated dog like this. And so you can see in this middle picture, that big uh, area of skin that had died um, and is kind of pulling away from the edges, then that's related to the infection. Certainly you can see all this really bright pink tissue under there. That is what's called granulation tissue. And when we're managing wounds, that's the tissue you actually really want to see. And so that big slough of, we call it an eschar of skin was basically serving as a giant scab on the dog. Um, so she formed all that granulation tissue under there. Um, and then the infection is what kind of started to set her back. So the challenge with Raven is the portion of the wound you can see is actually the tip of the iceberg. So um, she's a pretty big dog and I think I've got, I've got more pictures. So I could, she, she, we were having issues because of the infection, getting her to actually adhere her skin to her body wall. So even though this, the actual wound opening isn't, I mean, it's big, but it doesn't look as impressive you could actually slip your hand under and wrap it around both at tops of her shoulders. So I could put under her skin and then go all the way down to her knees on both sides, to the base of her tail, and then almost to ventral midline as well. Um, so none of that skin is adhered to her body. So she basically just has like a big pajama suit of skin right now um, in these pictures. So most of what we were doing with her was trying to get control of her infections so that we could get her skin to heal. Um, so in this picture, we're actually using what's called skin stretching with suture to kind of help see if we could get that skin to close in the meantime, while we're waiting to get her infection under control. Um, and it makes her, her actual wounding much smaller. But the good thing about Raven, even though the wound itself was pretty impressive, we didn't have to do a lot of big grafting in her because of the way that her skin wasn't adhering. She actually was kind of accordioning her skin on herself. So we were able to just kind of hike it up over her back whenever we closed her. And so about two months after she presented, we finally were able to get her skin up over her back to close her. This is the only wound we had left. It was an area of corners, um, but uh, she ended up finally healing beautifully. The last bandage change that we did on her before we definitively closed her was the very first time that we got her skin to adhere to her body. And then we had to break it all down to be able to pull it over her back. But uh, she was very deeply loved at our hospital. Um, we were all pretty obsessed with her, which is why the residents and students that worked on her case made her this poster to send home with her. Um, she had a bandage on that we decorated each day. Um, you can't see it very well because I'm covering it in this picture, but it's got a big R on it with a shield. So she was a superhero. She was the best girl. So her total bill ended up being about $25,000. Um, she was in hospital for two months. Um, her owners loved her a lot. The heavy duty antibiotics we had to use actually cause a kidney injury in her as well, which is part of why her bill ended up being so high. Um, the dog never stopped eating in hospital. She didn't care about anything we did to her. Uh, she was literally the best dog that ever existed. Um, so don't have any doubts why the owners wanted to spend so much money on her, but um, I know she's doing really well. They've recently moved to Florida and I finally got a picture of her with all her hair, her hair grown back. It's very poor quality or I would have put it in the PowerPoint, but uh, she's doing really, really well and acts like nothing happened. So very impressive wound on her. Um, and then, you know, to finish it off, this is my other most impressive wound, Luna. So Luna is a six month old, still alive. Um, six month old uh, cockapoo mix of some kind that actually got a third degree burn from a heating pad at a different clinic during her spay. Um, so this picture over here is after her first bride bed. She had a similar issue where it was like a three weeks later situation, the skin finally died and she got an infection under there. Um, so it all basically sloughed off. So she doesn't have the same level of granulation tissue here that Raven did, which is why it doesn't look as smooth. But note this little island of skin that was still alive and hanging on for dear life. We actually used that in all of her reconstruction. We named it after the resident that didn't believe in the island that wanted me to remove it every time we debrided her. Um, we kept it in place, uh, but she ended up finally being closed. She was in hospital, again, mostly infection related, which was the biggest struggle we deal with in these really big wounds. 
I'm sure most of you have heard of people with burns and stuff that expand most of their body. It's, it's infection that ends up being the biggest driver in um, death and issues with those, but it's the same issue with Luna, but she was a trooper through all of it. Um, she, at the very end of her, so this one was, we were getting ready to send her home. She has a little bit of skin death from her, um, her little skin flap that we used on this side here. Um, uh, but, uh, that was healing. Well, we were going to pull her IV catheters and send her home. And then she got a stomach ulcer and had to stay in hospital for a little bit longer, but she did very well, um, and was able to go home. I think her bill ended up being around $16,000. So a little less than Raven. Um, and then this picture here was just what I sent to my resident. This is that island of skin that lived. So this is me heckling my resident. Um, the Bianca Alva Island is living its best life still. Um, but that thing looked the best the whole time. So the best lesson about this is don't remove skin until you're sure it's dead. Because that, that island actually made our reconstruction much easier. Um, so I actually have a great video. This is um, the co most common type of dressing that we use in these really big wounds whenever it limits the amount of time it can be left on for three to five days, limits the amount of days in a row that you have to sedate patients. Um, and it also has some positive effects for improving granulation tissue. It's called a vacuum assisted closure. Um, there's a lot of noise in this, but I left it so that uh, you could hear the noise the machine makes, but there's a sponge under here and then we put an occlusive um, adhesive drape over top of it. And then there's a tubing here that goes to a machine that holds suction on it. And if you watch about a 45 second long video, oh, it's not gonna let me listen to it, but if you watch, you'll notice um, that after, because it just looks like we're just petting the dog and stuff, but you'll see this all suction down on itself. It's hard to know when it's gonna happen. Oh, you can hear it. That's that background noise that sounds like a vacuum. So it suctions down that sponge. It's usually the most gratifying portion of the whole bandage change when that happens. But it's much more comfortable for the dogs. It can assist in that skin stretching we talked about earlier as well. Um, and it limits the amount of time that we have to sedate them and things too, so they can have a break from bandage changes and things. So we use it a lot at the hospital. Um, it's really common in people to actually will send people home with vac or vacuum assisted closures, um, but uh, we don't routinely send them home. This dog actually chewed through her canister tubing about seven times um, because she's a puppy and she was so bored. Um, but uh, any questions about Luna or Raven? They had very similar injuries, but from different causes. Yes. Great question. So the question was, do these types of injuries limit their movement? Initially, yes. Um, so whenever we stretch their skin and things, they don't want to move and they just kind of do this a little bit, but the skin is also a very amazing organ. Um, it has uh, what's called viscoelastic properties. And so over time, it will stretch and adapt and actually build more skin to adapt to that motion and things. So because we were able to close them primarily, that actually didn't limit their movement. If we were to let that skin um, just heal by second intention or scar formation, then it certainly could, especially around joints and things. Um, it, they can get what's called contracture, um, where it actually can limit their movement quite a bit. It's more of an issue on the limbs than it is on the back, but it, it's one of the reasons why we try to primarily close them and actually get skin to touch skin, because the skin will adapt much easier than a scar can. Does that make sense? But yeah, skin is amazing. That's what makes wounds so much fun to treat. Any other questions about the wound cases? Well, that's the video again. Here's a picture of Luna having her Maybelline moment. We asked the student to take some pictures, some glamour shots for her mom, and this is what she came back with. It's pretty impressive. So the students are usually the best ones at getting the pictures for the owners. So there's this one and then the picture that was on her her slide earlier where she's on her back looking adorable, but this dog definitely grew in hospital. I saw the picture that I saw of her on her record for when she first came in, she looks like a very different dog now. So we had her for about 45 days total, I think, because they stay in hospital with us when we're treating them for wound management because there's too much intensive work and things for them to be able to go in and out of the hospital, especially with the pandemic. 
Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great question. So the question was, are owners allowed to visit whenever they're in hospital for that duration of time? So yes and no. Um, yes, uh, whenever they're able to go outdoors, we do try to get them visits, especially when the dogs are in hospital that long. Um, a lot of these dogs end up having pretty resistant infections, so we have to be pretty cautious about moving them through the hospital. Um, Raven, in particular, literally lived in our isolation unit for almost the entire two months she lived there. Um, her owners were not able to visit her, mostly because of their schedule. But after a certain period of time when the dogs can't go outdoors, because um, there's actually a special potty area in there, they start to forget that they're dogs and just assume this is their life now. And sometimes they can get pretty depressed. Luckily, Raven didn't have that issue. Luna didn't have that issue because we've learned a lot in the about year and a half since we've had these really long-term wound cases about, you know, when we cover their wounds, even when they have really resistant infections, it shouldn't be a risk to the hospital if they're covered with those adhesive dressings. That's part of why we've used the back systems too, because it's a closed system. So it limits infection risk to the rest of the hospital. So in those cases, if we can get them outdoors, we do try to have the owners come visit. Luna's owners got to see videos and pictures more than anything, because the pandemic is still a very real thing. And that is really the big limiting factor for us right now for owner visits, because we're trying to limit the number of people coming in and out of the hospital with COVID. Um, but for her, this is an emotional support animal for this owner. Um, so I think we did organize a couple of visits for her, especially when she got her gastric ulcer as well, because we were a little worried about how she was going to do. Um, she had enough bleeding. She actually required a transfusion during that time. Um, but uh, when they, when pandemic aside, we do try to have owners come visit the dogs. It's just better for everyone involved. Owners can see the progress. The dogs start to feel better. They're more willing to eat usually for their owners. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges with keeping them in the hospital for that duration of time from a lot of different aspects. But the visiting thing is one that's really important for everyone's well-being. So we try to make up for that whenever possible with the pandemic, um, with either organizing outdoor visits, which we're getting into winter, which is going to make things harder again. Um, but videos and pictures also help owners to be able to see the progress. We've also FaceTimed dogs with their owners as well which I don't think that the dogs appreciate the actual video component of it as much, but they definitely appreciate being able to hear their owner's voices. And depending on the student that's on, sometimes the students will actually put the owners on speakerphone with the dogs too, which seems so silly, but it really does make a big difference for the dogs um, being able to hear their owner's voices. So they usually are looking for their owners because they don't recognize the FaceTime video very well, but that's another way that we've gotten around it with the pandemic because, and sometimes when they're in the isolation ward, if we can't physically get them outdoors, um, that's another way that we've kind of addressed that issue. Any other questions? It was a really long-winded answer about visiting. <laughs> yes. Whenever you're doing like surgery or something that you don't want to like experience, what do you normally do? Yeah, so the question was, what do I do to prepare for procedures that I haven't done a lot? So the good thing about my training was that I learned a lot of baseline principles of how to approach cases like that. So even though there's many cases that are rare and not expected, like Ava's case, um, Bo's case is a common case we see, but kind of an abnormal presentation of it. Um, really, it's just reading a lot of the literature. Um, if it's a disease process I'm not familiar with, I'll read a textbook about it. Um, there's lots of opportunities to talk to colleagues and things too. It's one of the nice things about working in a bigger hospital. So I talk to my boss that's been a surgeon for 30 years, probably every day about cases just to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, and uh, there's also opportunities through like our, the soft tissue surgery society has a listserv that people will post really rare stuff on. Um, but for the procedure itself, there's not really a whole lot of advanced techniques um, that uh, I, I couldn't do at this stage. But if there's something, a procedure I haven't done a lot that may have a, tri a tricky uh, technical component of it, the other option would be to practice on a cadaver, which isn't really an option in human medicine, but we have the ability to do that in veterinary medicine sometimes. Um, so it's usually animals that are being used for, um, that have been euthanized for unrelated purposes that are used for educational purposes and veterinary medicine. 
Um, so there are some opportunities in that regard as well, but most of it is reading and talking to colleagues and things. Um, I try to, because I am more junior than a lot of my colleagues as well at OSU, um, our surgical oncology service does a lot of really advanced procedures. So whenever possible, I try to scrub it with them too, to kind of build my skills and see how, how they do things as well. Um, but really it's just trusting my training and uh, reading up about it. Um, but a lot of it is, it sounds really scary, but most of the things at this stage are basically based in anatomy and just understanding the disease process and how we're gonna fix it in that regard. But sometimes with the uh, explorers, it's a surprise because we're using the explorer as a diagnostic test. Um, in addition to the imaging we may already have, that was the case with Ava, but luckily for us, Ava's surgical disease was actually fairly straightforward in that she had a pinky sized adhesion to an intestinal loop that we were able to dissect out. Um, we removed a portion of her intestines associated with that, but um, most commonly that's going to be the case where we're not really sure what we're going to find and then it ends up being a very, pretty straightforward surgical disease. It's more so leading up to a it's the mystery of what is it going to be, but if I'm ever unsure and I need to practice, there are options for that. There's simulators and things too, um, not as advanced as they have in human medicine, but there's options for that too. We just got a laparoscopic, um, which is one of the minimally invasive techniques. We got a simulator for that that we can use to practice those. That's kind of the next big step that we're trying to take at OSU now is doing those types of things. Did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, how did you decide between pursuing shelter medicine surgery? Great question. So um, if people on Zoom ask it, then you guys can all see it in the chat. Um, so I chose between shelter medicine and surgery, really it's the desire to want to do individualized medicine versus herd health in the shelter. Um, it was very disheartening to see the amazing animals that people will throw away in shelter medicine, which for a lot of people, that's a big driver to say in it. For me, um, I felt like uh, it was, I think my breaking point was we had a 11 year old boxer that was uh, relinquished because it didn't match the new couch the owner bought. Um, and that was kind of the breaking point for me. Um, so it really, shelter medicine highlights the worst of humanity, um, which certainly you see that all throughout vet med. We've had cases of pretty horrific wounds or fractures from people throwing dogs against walls and things like that too. But I think in shelter, you just see so much more of it and it takes a very special type of person to do that type of medicine. And I am definitely not it. Um, but uh, I also really liked the idea of being able to potentially cut to cure and things like that. And having that kind of finite saving life situation, which not that there isn't that in shelter medicine, um, you save lives in a very different way um, and a broader spectrum in shelter medicine. Um, but to me, the downside of it didn't outweigh the good side of it. I don't think I would be able to let the things go you need to let go to be an effective shelter vet. I just would have been angry all of the time. Um, whereas with surgery, at least there's a lot of other interests and in things that can deflect that even in the bad situations. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah. Do you like in surgery just exclusively do companion animals? Yeah. So the question was in surgery, do I just exclusively do companion animals? Yes. However, which I should have included pictures of it, um, I got to do surgery on a cheetah this year, which was amazing. Um, I amputated one of the toes on a cheetah at the zoo this year for a traumatic injury she had. Um, but uh, we do have some surgeries that we get to do with zoo animals. I know koala had surgery um, at OSU not that long ago within the time that I've been there. Um, and uh, I know that I think Barnum and Bailey brought through a bunch of their tigers to get spayed right before I got there, right at the very beginning of my time at OSU as well. But primarily I'm just working with small animals, so dogs and cats. There is a whole other specialty of surgery in the last 30 years has gone from you had to get boarded in both large and small animal to just either large or small animal. Um, and now they've even uh, broken it down further into food animal and equine. So you either do horses, food animal, or small animal. You can do all, but most people choose one. The, the way that we treat those animals is so varied.
it's hard to be a really good specialist at all of them. Even the people that are double that are boarded in both, like my boss that's been a, a surgeon for 30 years, she only does small animal. So usually people will still choose one. Similar to whenever you go into vet med anyway, like you guys, you as a veterinarian, you could treat all those species, but usually people choose one, except for the mixed practice vets that are, I don't know how they do it. It's amazing. Just the amount of knowledge you have to have. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So the question was, are there uh, legal uh, avenues that we can take to pursue people who um, we suspect are neglecting or abusing their animals? Yes, we've had to do that before with cases. Um, uh, usually we get the Humane Society involved in those situations to be able to determine what we need to do next, but we definitely have had cases where we have had to recommend relinquishment of animals from homes um, in those situations. Luckily, they are few and far between. Usually people are just trying to do what's best for their animal, but there definitely have been times where owners will like jokingly admit, oh yeah, my dog's femur fracture, which is a very hard bone to break, happened because I was angry at it and threw it against a wall. That happened the last couple of months, which is why I've said it multiple times. Um, but uh, it's very rare that that happens. But if we have concerns or suspicions, we have a social worker at OSU that helps in those regards too, um, to kind of talk to owners. And then we also will usually get the Humane Society in to help with that legal component of it. It's not something I personally have had to deal with. Um, so I don't know all of the avenues that we need to pursue, but I don't think that in Ohio we are required to report those situations, but usually most of you know that animal abuse is a marker for violent activity in people in general. So it's kind of dangerous in multiple accounts. If somebody is abusing or neglecting an animal, we usually are gonna say something. A little easier in shelter medicine because you have all of the tools right there, but uh, um, it's something that we unfortunately see like we had a 14 year old kid that wrapped rubber bands around its dog's lower jaw and didn't say anything until it completely ate through to the mandible of the dog. Um, 13 is too old to be doing that. So any other questions? It's ending on a very sad note. So I'll just look at how great Luna looks. Yes. Great question. So the question was, how do you go about studying um, like small animal exotics or exotic surgery? Um, so there's definitely specialty fields for exotics. The vast majority of people that do companion animal exotics are primarily just working from reading from books. So what I try to teach a lot of our veterinary students is you aren't going to school to learn how to be a vet like you are, but you're also learning how to be able to teach yourself to be able to gain skills as you go. You don't leave that school a 100% phenomenal veterinarian. You get the skills to be able to continue to build them later. And exotic veterinarians use that skill more than anybody. Um, so a lot of it is really kind of picking and choosing. And honestly, exotic medicine, especially in the companion animal field, is more about husbandry than anything else. Most of the issues that you have in exotic animals is going to be related, especially exotic companion animals, is related to husbandry or failure of husbandry um, and how to come back from that. Um, as far as specific surgery, I'm not sure there's a specialty for that yet, but it's a growing field. So it's probably going to be coming during my career time for sure, for sure in yours. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I know that there is a zoo and exotics uh, residency and specialty, but I'm not sure that they've gotten to just a companion animal one just yet. Um, and I don't know if it's the lack of interest or, or just a lack of people who are qualified enough to build that college that actually want to do it. Um, but hopefully there'll be more opportunities because there are a lot of people that really want to do it. And it's a really hard field to kind of bridge out to. I have a couple of friends in vet school that do it, um, not exclusively, but that do a lot of companion animal exotics. And it's a whole different ball game, really, with the way that you have to practice. Did that answer your question? Um, so practicing, practicing on, on college. 
basically. So the question was, uh, do people start out um, in vet school learning about small animal surgery and then branch out to learn more and more exotics? Yes, there's certainly electives and things at most universities where you can take um, courses about exotic medicine and learn some of the baseline things like you do in the other species. Um, you definitely learn some large animal surgery as well, but you're learning basic skills essentially in vet med um, in vet school that you're going to use to further build your skills and take additional and things. We can't teach you everything you have to be able to do as a veterinarian. We basically teach you the baseline things you need to do to be able to get started. And then you take CE and build your skills as you go. And exotics is one of those fields that is going to encompass a lot of that. Certainly, again, there's ways to specialize in it. Um, there are electives, more and more rotations, uh, more and more schools are allowing you to take out rotations where you can rotate through and see exotic veterinarians work. And I think that helps a lot too, to kind of build that network and be able to see who else um, is doing it and what they're doing. Um, but a lot of people that I know that have gone into companion animal exotics and surgery um, are basically choosing practices to start out in that have people who do a lot of exotic medicine that they can learn from. And then learning the skills on how to bridge those gaps so that you don't know in your knowledge. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions I can answer? I unfortunately am not a great expert on exotics. I wish I was, they're really fun animals to treat, but there's a lot of nuance there that in a lot of expansive um, diversity in those species. Yes. Common. Um, diaphragmatic hernias is, uh, it was, the question was how often do we see them? We see them pretty commonly. Um, it's usually related to trauma or we see them commonly in cats as an incidental finding. Um, they come in fits and spurts where we'll see like five to seven of them in a row and then we won't see them for a while. Um, but I would say they're one of the more common things we see in soft tissue surgery. Um, we don't always have to take them to surgery when they're traumatic. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes when they're congenital we do. Um, the, uh, um, the ones like, uh, oh, what are they called? The hiatal hernias, um, which people get as well. We see those commonly in brachycephalic dogs. Commonly, we don't have to take those dogs to surgery for it. We can medically manage them, but that's another component of diaphragmatic hernias that we'll see pretty commonly. But yeah, her diaphragmatic hernias are one of the more common things we see. Any other questions? We'll all stick around for questions, but if you guys want to feel free to make sure.